Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Earth Day 2022. Um, we are very excited to be uh, hosting this discussion today as a joint um, discussion between the Jamyang Buddhist Center in London and the International Tibet Network, um, as well as the Tibet climate crisis. So it's, um, it's a really great opportunity to highlight um, what's happening in Tibet in terms of the environment and also bring in some different uh, topics of discussion in terms of research and historical and cultural connections between Tibet and its uh, connection to conservation and uh, spirituality and Buddhism and as well as um, bringing in some more recent things in terms of campaigns uh, that have to do with Tibet, Tibet's third pole, and a lot of important topics that we're going to get to. So uh, my name is Kunzang, and I am the uh, Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion Coordinator um, at the Jamyang Buddhist Center. And I'm going to hand it over to Rashi and Lopsan Yangso to introduce themselves. So Lopsan Yangso, if you would like to go first. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Tashi Belek. Uh, so I'm Lopsang and I'm the program and environment this, uh, coordinator of International Tibet Network. And uh, so right now I'm based here in Dharamsala. Hi, everyone. I'm Rashi. I'm the campaigns coordinator at International Tibet Network and I'm based in London. Nice to meet everyone. Awesome. Um, so today I think is kind of uh, a really special opportunity because we actually, I mean, I, I really haven't seen them. Um, many discussions that really kind of connect these two areas when we talk about uh, climate justice and we talk about Tibet. Um, and also uh, for my work at, the, at Jamyang, you know, we talk a lot about uh, spiritual practice and things that we can do in our everyday lives to um, kind of help our uh, help and do our part in terms of um, you know saving the planet and everything so I think this is a really great opportunity so I'm going to hand it over to Lopes Yangso who is going to give us um, some great background uh, about Tibet and its climate. Uh, thank you Kusang. So when you talk, uh, when we talk about uh, Tibet, I think uh, it's it's very crucial that uh, everyone knows that first and foremost uh, is that <clears throat> Tibet is under occupation, and uh, so we also have to understand that the Chinese occupation of Tibet is the root cause of uh, climate or environment mismanagement in 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 Tibet. And having said that, uh, uh, so right now, because of the climate change and because of the uh, man-made uh, you know, activities or uh, Chinese government's policy, we see and we have witnessed a huge number of environment disasters and uh, environment problems in, in, in Tibet, such as the uh, melting of glaciers or um, melting of permafrost and then grassland degradation as well. And then, uh, and so when we look at that, uh, so why uh, Tibet is, uh, you know, uh, facing such kind of problem is that uh, first uh, Tibet is also the front line of global climate crisis, which means that uh, uh, as, as compared to the global average temperature, Tibet is warming two to three times faster than the rest of the world. And because of that warming, uh, the glaciers are melting uh, uh, very, very fast and drastically. And that will uh, leave impact on the uh, the water, the river sources that uh, flows from Tibet to the downstream nations. And almost like 1.4 billion Asian populations are dependent on the water that flows from Tibet. But uh, right now, what I felt uh, is that um, when we talk about climate change, um, people who are uh, most affected by the climate change are the least contributed uh, in greenhouse, greenhouse gas. And when it comes to Tibet, um, 
the real problem is that uh, uh, when we look from the global climate discussion, uh, Tibetans are officially uh, not represented in the UN climate discussions. Uh, so uh, Tibetans are also ignored uh, in climate policy making and also climate policy uh, uh, implementation. So why that is so? Because of the uh, colonialism and the climate crisis that we face. And because of that, then we have a huge uh, responsibility and uh, we has, we also, everyone uh, also have a huge responsibility and action. And then because of that collaboration and, uh, you know, uh, the exchange of research and collaboration work is very important when it comes to climate crisis uh, in Tibet. And having said that, another issue that I think we need to focus is that um, what happens in, in, in Tibet is that uh, Tibetan um, people, the local Tibetan people are uh, excluded in the policy making uh, and their traditional knowledge or traditional practice uh, practices of environment protection and environment conservation is uh, completely ignored in terms of uh, climate change uh, policy making. And uh, so secondly, uh, when uh, it comes to climate justice or uh, uh, people um, who work for the climate, the, the, the environment defenders or env environmentalists. So when they come out and then talk about uh, climate change, so they end up in prison and they are politicized by the Chinese government. And uh, so they faced uh, lots of uh, difficult situations, not only to them and also to their family members. Uh, so these are the problems that we have. And so, uh, I mean, we being based outside Tibet and in exile, uh, it's, I feel that it's uh, really, really difficult, uh, you know, to, to work uh, uh, on the Tibet climate crisis. Uh, but then what we try to do is try to uh, build campaigns and have a coordinated campaigns with the Tibet groups. And uh, so having said that, Tibetan inside Tibet, uh, uh, in, in Tibet are really, uh, you know, working really hard and then they work really inspire uh, personally to me. And uh, so when, when we look at their uh, work, uh, the, 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 the Pun religion and also the Buddhism has really influenced on their uh, environment conservation and their, their uh, practices uh, as well. Because uh, even though, I mean, when we, uh, at, at current level, they, even though they don't uh, speak or they don't use the, uh, you know, the, the modern jargon uh, climate uh, crisis word or the scientific terms, but then uh, the practice of environment protection or the practice of uh, environment conservation has been always with uh, in the Tibetan community uh, historically. So that means that they have knowledge and they have a they have also a right uh, to protect their land. But then that is uh, completely negated in 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 Tibet. And so with with that, what I what I feel is that uh, you know we not being not part in the whole global discussion it's it's a uh, very difficult and very challenging but uh, i think that uh, uh, today uh, being the the earth day everyone has a uh, in a responsibility and uh, so first and foremost uh, creating awareness about uh, tibet climate crisis and then educating yourself is is really really important and then also uh, you know um, protection of environment and then protecting their water, protecting the forest and planting trees uh, uh, is a great initiative that everyone can take uh, nowadays. And so that will, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we hope that, you know, that will bring some, some changes. And even uh, within our Tibetan community, I feel that we still uh, lack uh, uh, human resources and, uh, you know, the fundings, the resources, uh, to the people who or the to the organizations who work on environment issues so i think we need to also focus on that and uh, then i think uh, i'll end here and i hope we will have uh, more discussions later 
Great. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great. Um, so now I think we're going to move on to Rashi, who's going to share with us some of the uh, ongoing campaigns and things that are happening at ITN and with Tibet Third Pole, Tibet Climate Crisis. Um, so if you want to just take it from here, Rashi. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we have had Tibet Climate Crisis as a campaign for a while now, um, and all key Tibet groups across the world are prioritizing it this year. I mean, we did it last year as well with COP26, and with COP27 coming up in Egypt uh, this year, it's, again, a priority. It is a campaign that is going to remain the main focus for a while. Um, and the overarching goal of the campaign is to raise global awareness around Tibet climate crisis in occupied Tibet and to have Tibetan voices highlight the significance of the climate crisis narrative. I think, um, like Ripsang said, there are a lot of issues, whether it's damming, whether it's mining, whether it's nomad resettlement, all of these are crucial issues that I think people need to educate themselves on. And the reason we're saying that is because when you educate yourself and when you go and read up about it, you can ask, you can then go on and educate other people. Like, for example, the Chinese um, authorities have resettled to around about 2 million uh, nomads in the last couple of years. And these Tibetan nomads have been living on the grasslands for millennia. And they, they are like proud, resilient people. And now they've been moved from these grasslands. Um, and that has an impact on the biodiversity of the region as well. And the reason that they're doing it, the Chinese authorities have been doing it is to build national parks and reserves for, you know, it, it's it's for the glorification of the landscape for Chinese tourists. So that's something that, that we will be focusing on. Um, nomad resettlement is one of them. Um, and the second is... Um, I mean, it really bothers me when people say, you know, the, uh, be the voice for Tibetans in Tibet, but Tibetans in Tibet have a voice and they have been screaming. We have uh, Anya Sendra, we have Karma Samdo, who has who are environmentalists and activists and they have been taking action. So um, Tibetans in Tibet uh, don't need us, uh, and I'm by us I mean non-Tibetans, to be their voice. They already have a voice. What we need to do is amplify it. So if you have the privilege and if you have... Um, the uh, if you have the freedom to use your voice then use it to amplify the voices of tibetan activists in tibet uh anya sengra is there uh karma samdhut is there there are so many other people who have been putting their lives on the line um so go on tibetclimatecrisis.org there are petitions that you can share there are resources that you can share um and there's a lot of potential to do with this campaign with so many targets that we have um, so it's definitely something that people should be focusing on, educating themselves, and so that they can educate others. Great, thank you. And um, I know for everyone who's joining us uh, live on our different platforms, if you have any questions, don't you? We don't have to wait until the end. Uh, if you have questions and you want to just type them into the comments uh, area. Um, we'll see them and we can uh, ask them uh, at the end. So you don't have to wait. So you can just start chatting now. You can add questions in the comment box. Uh, but I actually, so I, I think I'll I'll start by um, going back to Lopsi Youngso. And I think it's interesting that you mentioned that, uh, you know, the, the Tibetans inside of Tibet who are, like, like you're saying, are historically are conservationists and um, I know it, the last time I saw you in person was right after COP26, and we had this whole discussion about, you know, how um, the efforts for conservation and essentially, like, I guess what you're saying is that they're not really, they don't call it activism, they don't call it, you know, being a part of the movement, environmental movement necessarily, but it's something that is, what seems to me as inherently a part of everything that they do, the consciousness about care for the planet and um, being a part of their cultural um, upbringing. And um, could you talk a little bit more about how, about the the impact of Buddhist culture or Bon culture or 
the philosophy that um, influences people because I know you know you you mentioned to me that you're from a lot from Tibet from com from these areas and you have family members who are nomadic people and have this relationship with the land which I think is really um, special so you could could you like elaborate a little bit more about that uh yeah i mean um so um uh i think uh, in 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 our community so we have uh, this uh, you know an belief of a sacred mountain and uh, sacred uh, lake and or sacred rivers right so this has been really uh, i mean a belief system that has been there for like thousands of years which is like influenced both by pun religion and the buddhism as well so with that uh, so when when we say sacred mountains or or sacred rivers so what we mean it means is that uh, the these mountains and these rivers are not there to be exploited which is right now happening in in tibet and so every year uh, you know the tibetans we during the auspicious days or during the uh, you know the new years we we go up on the mountain and then we worship that Uh, but right now what what happened in in reality is that um, because of the loss of chinese uh, uh, tourist uh, so they go up there they they pollute and uh, then when i when i went home to visit my ho- hometown paiyu um, what i saw is that uh, so many waste and so many so many garbage has been thrown in the river or 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 on the mountains and that's that's like really really sad uh, to see that and i think in that uh, i think the grassroots organizations and every in- individual over there has a huge responsibility to not to pollute the land the their land and then in terms of the buddhist concept of interdependence and uh, you know the that uh, has al- also shaped uh, in terms of uh, you know the many tibetans in in the environment protection saying that we human being are interdependent with the with the nature and uh, if we pollute the nature so that we also impact our life and then the animals around are us so that concept uh, is a really important and when whenever we we uh, read or uh, or study any of the uh, the environmentalist the uh, they uh, work uh, so almost everyone said that you know i am very much influenced by the the pun or the buddhism religion and so it's in our culture and so uh, so it's my responsibility to protect land and actually you know now because of the you know modernization or the colonialism so everyone feels that you know nature is something that you have to exploit or nature is something that you have to conquer so which is completely against because right now everyone also says that you know time is running out and we have to protect and uh, so i think uh, we really have to you know uh, think over that and then really uh, bring changes in our lifestyle as as well and then other uh, uh, parties that uh, you know even historically during 13 uh, dalai lama the so uh, during that time you know the tibet already had uh, you know i mean the policies the government policies uh, in terms of environment protection and in in tibetan language it says relung uh, satsik uh, where you know the government officials or the villagers uh, you know they, uh, they 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 tell the people to you know not to pollute or not to not to uh, exploit uh, natural resources or not not to pollute the you know, the nature uh, and then protect and especially in the month of sakadawa uh, uh, which is like auspicious uh, aus- um, auspicious uh, month for the buddhism to practice uh, and during that time you know people also being careful not to go on the you know Uh, the mountains or the pollute so the, these practices has been there for really long and another example is the nomad right i mean earlier russia has also talked about nomads relocation and nomads has been living on their own land for thousands of years but right now because of the chinese occupation the china thinks that nomad is the root cause of environment dis- destruction or the grassland di- destruction that is happening on 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 the tibetan plateau and then they say that the policy of poverty elevation saying that nomadic way of life is very barbaric very barbaric and very poor 
so uh, so they have influ uh, they have practiced the policy of nomad forceful nomadic relocation and that is completely you know going against the nature going against the will of the people right and that also says that nomadic people are not included in the policy making and they were never consulted uh, in their their policy and so the policies that we see in tibet is always the top down it's the government who uh, you know pose the policy and it has never been the policy has never been the you know from the grassroots and then you know uh, having a consulting with them and then put forwarding the policies so i think right now we are in a very critical situation and uh, so uh, as i said also earlier you know tibet being a occupied nation and it's very difficult uh, for whole this uh, struggle and uh, i personally feel that unless until the the political we don't have a political solution in in tibet the the environment destruction in tibet will continue and uh, so i think uh, and the second is that uh, in in a global discussion there is no official representation of tibetan tibetans are never consulted in the ipcc report the un climate change report right tibetans are never included in the uh, un climate change conference the so called the cop 26 or cop 27 so these are the challenges that we we have and uh, so but then um people who are inside uh, tibet they are sacrificing their lives and uh, so uh, they are continuously you know uh, working for the environment conservation and uh, especially i feel that uh, the monasteries and the religious leaders are taking a huge responsibility in terms of protecting the environment and i think that that's a really great initiative and uh, afforestation has been going uh, really wide inside tibet and in terms of tree plantation i feel that the chinese government also has a you know the uh, you know policy of afforestation so that that's that's a good initiative and uh, that's a good initiative and so because they they realize that uh, you know the because of the flooding the kind of natural uh, disaster that we we see they realize that you know protecting the you know, uh, forest and the trees are important so such kind of policies should be you know carry inside uh, tibet and so since we already have uh, this rich uh, you know our culture and our tradition and our religious practices so we don't have uh, to rely on the western concept of environment uh, preservation we already have that uh, you know knowledge uh, with ourselves and so we so the, the government uh, should uh, allow the tibetans to protect their land and then uh, the whole the glo global community also should recognize the significance and the rich uh, traditional knowledge or rich uh, religious practices that tibetans have and so that that is an i i think uh, another solution of um, protecting tibet and also the whole whole asia the billions of people who are dependent uh, uh their their livelihood uh, for uh, for all the rivers that that flow from from tibet and so it's all interdependence so uh, so i mean we see all the natural disasters disasters right so no one can accept, uh, escape from that so yeah so that's the that's the rea reality thank you yes thank you so much um so i think that that's a a, a great way of explaining a lot of the the ways that it is connected. So I think at this point, maybe we could, uh, again, everyone who's watching live, if you would like to send us a question for Rashi or Lhosa Yangso, uh, please pop it in the comments. Um, and I think I will start with a question for Rashi. Um, Rashi, what ways can we connect Tibet with the overall climate movement? So like what ways, and I've also thought about this a lot too, like thinking about the um, climate justice and the movement and also having been to COP26 and seeing uh, another climate justice protests. And sometimes when you go with like a contingent of people to join these protests, like 
what are some other ways that we can sort of in either a like insert Tibet into the larger narrative of the climate movement or maybe in a smaller way or, or what kind of ways uh, do you think that we could do that on a practical level? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So just to add something to what Lopsang was saying before, um, it's really all interconnected. I think um, climate action, when you think about taking climate action, whether it's spe especially in case of Tibet, climate action is political action and political action is climate action. They are so interconnected just because Tibet is an occupied country. Um, Tibetans in Tibet and Tibetans in exile have been pushing to safeguard um, nomadic rights, to stop damming, to stop mining. So I think way that people can help out is by first highlight the significance of Tibetan climate crisis. I think Tibet is at the front line of the climate crisis. Like Lopsan said, we are losing, um, where he losing ice at three times faster than the global average. Um, so the you know the rising temperatures, the melting of the permafrost, the it's a climate feedback um, loop. You know, humans release carbon dioxide, the earth gets hotter, then the tundra thaws, then more uh, carbon dioxide and methane is released, then the earth gets hotter again, the Arctic sea melts, the dark sea water absorbs sunlight, and the earth gets hotter. And it's such a vicious loop that by by being a part of it, the one thing that you can do is talk about it and to educate yourself and make sure that you're raising Tibet in these in these conversations. And there is already an existing global climate movement. So by um by taking part in conferences and AGMs of Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth or taking part in protests by Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion, Rebellion the, there are already all these platforms that exist. Um, but if 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 you don't have the resources to you know start your own chapter, go join them, talk about Tibet there. And the other thing that you can do is find a Tibet group in in your country, in 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 your city. There are so many of them. Tibet Network website has um, you can see it on the map. You can go and see where uh, nearest Tibet group is. Most of them are running campaigns of Tibet climate crisis. If they're not. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us. We can help start um, and provide materials for it. Um, that's something that you can do. And the second, and I think the most important thing, and that's something that um, Lopsang also said, that, you know, in, in COP26 and COP27 that's coming up, um, Tibetans, Tibetans are not there on the panel. They're not deciding policies. So raise Tibetans as the solution. Make sure that you're using your privilege to talk about that. And this is all because of colonization. We've seen it with uh, Native Americans in the US. We've seen it First Nations within Canada. That's exactly the same thing that's happening now in 21st century, in 2022, in Tibet. China is, China has colonized Tibet. And they are pushing out people who, who are from that land for, for profits. So make sure you talk about that and make sure you uh, raise Tibetans as solution seekers. They They have... Like Lopsang said, they have historically been, you know, protectors of the land. Um, and that's right there is the solution. So their voices matter and their voices matter most when you talk about climate solutions. Great. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so kind of piggybacking off of that a little bit, uh, we have another question, uh, which I guess either of you could answer, how has the Chinese government's climate policy changed over time? Has there been any movement at all in recent years? Thanks, Cam Love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, before going on the climate uh, policy, uh, uh, I would also add on a few things that uh, Rashi uh, discussed earlier. So uh, uh, and uh, so, how can how can an an individual be part of the whole Tibet uh, climate movement, right? So one, I feel that uh, it's it's very important for our uh, youths to to take interest on that and to take participate on that. When we look at the whole global climate movement, we have seen uh, the young young people coming on a stage and uh, I mean raising voices and asking questions 
to the governments or or the pol policy makers right so i think uh, that the 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 youth in our community also you know uh, i mean should that responsibility and uh, yes i mean i have seen recently you know uh, many many uh, young uh, people tibetan people or 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 the tibet support groups they they come and uh, uh, you know they they take part uh, in the whole global movement but we still need more and uh, uh, the whole uh, the climate movement is uh, something that everyone can participate and everyone should take a responsibility in that and the second is that right now social media is there and the, the younger generations are really good in social media and we have to take advantage of that and then uh, spread uh, you know the information or the create awareness and uh, so i think every every uh, you know individual uh, whether you be in a school or whether you are an artist or whether you are a singer or whether you are a, a filmmaker you know the, or writer so everyone can really really pay attention on the tibet climate crisis and then do a small part from from yourself and the second thing uh, in a, in exile or also in, in 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 tibet i would like to say that you know uh education is really important and especially in the schools uh i feel that we should definitely have a specific compulsory subject on environment and uh, tibet climate crisis uh, and then teach teach the young kids about the whole uh, Tibet's environment historically, you know, the natural resources, the landscape, and the kind of the challenges that the, uh, we face, and how we can uh, face those challenges, and what are the solutions. So that has been really, I feel, that included in the school curriculum, and then students, uh, the young young students can participate and then educate themselves and then slowly because at the younger generations would be the most affected uh, once 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 they grow up right i mean right now the kind of destruction that we see in tibet once the tibet uh, you know the movement uh, the problem resolve uh, i think uh, that everyone wants to go back to tibet and uh, even even me right i don't want to be stay here in india as an ex refugee or an uh, or in exile forever. So I also wish to go back to my homeland, right? So when I go back there, you know, I want to you know have a clean air. I want to have a clean uh, water and uh, where you know you can just uh, drink uh, you know water from the river flowing. But and then the clean land and then you know the whole grassland and the glaciers. So we we want that kind of uh, thing. Uh, and so just to have that and. So I think the younger generations should really, really take um, uh, initiatives and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, awareness uh, on that. And then coming, uh, coming to the government policies. Um, so when we say Chinese government policies, uh, the problem is that uh, one is implementation, right? When you, when we look in the Chinese government's policies in in paper, it it looks really, really good. Uh, but then the implementation is different at the different level because uh, when the policy implementation comes, the local government has the uh, the most power to implement, and the local government uh, sometimes you know they really prefer uh, economic development when uh, as uh, compared to the environment protection. So that is one problem where the local governments uh, they hardly have any incentive in terms of uh, protecting the environment. So that is one uh, limitation in the Chinese environment policies in Tibet. The second, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the policies are the top-down policies, right? The local Tibetans are not really included in the, uh, in the uh, policy making. And because of uh, those such cases that when the Tibetans, when they come out and protest or raise, voices against the mining so what happens we have we everyone's uh, you know have witnessed that right the whole paramilitary comes over there and then they don't have that space to raise their voice and and raise concern of their own land so that's the uh, i mean real real situation uh, in 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 tibet and so and the th third thing about the environment policy is that uh, you know 
sometimes, I mean, in, in terms of the one positive point that I would like to um, raise here is the afforestation. Afforestation is there, but then the kind of infrastructure that we see in Tibet is, it's so huge, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the Tibetan land uh, itself, the Tibetan plateau is very, very fragile and it's very uh, sensitive towards the climate crisis and the climate change. And that has to understand by the policymakers and uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the infrastructure development, the, the mining and the, the, the railway and the, the, the airports. Sometimes, you know, these are not there. For the Tibetan people, they these these policies, they, these uh, economic developments, are they inside Tibet to control or to rule the people? Right. So that's what we have to understand that because I think for them, for the Chinese government, uh, they think that uh, money or the economic development is the solution for all the problems that inside Tibet. But Tibetan people are uh, not happy about that. Because the kind of self emulations that we have uh, seen, uh, you know, uh, recently and the, for the past years, uh, the 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 young Tibetan, uh, you know, uh, the the artist Tsawan uh, Nupu is a very recent case, right? And he has not uh, seen uh, the uh, the free Tibet uh, earlier. He has not seen the 1959 Chinese occupation. He has not seen the uprising. In 1989 as well, but then he has been, uh, you know, in a, in a, his personal life, he has been really doing well in his career. But he self immolated for Tibet, so they sh there must be some some reason why uh, Tibetans are sacrificing their land, and this really clearly shows the kind of policies that we see and uh, the the two recent self immolations we hardly have a uh, you know information or uh, the real condition or any of the footage and the kind of restrictions that china has put is uh, uh, it's, it's 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 terrible and uh, but because of the global uh, you know political crisis and the kind of problems that we see all over so the tibetan the tibet issue gets neglected and uh, yeah, so so it's it's sometimes uh, I mean very very difficult, but I think uh, the hope is the only uh, I mean way, and uh, so we should we should continue and uh, then carry forward the whole uh, movement. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, so I know we I mean I've I have uh, some other questions uh, which either of you actually could answer, but. Um, I, why, you know, why should someone who cares about the environment care about Tibet? Because I know that we all are a little bit biased in the, the reasons why we care about Tibet and its environment. But can, I mean, do either of you obviously have some thoughts about why it matters for everybody? I think that, uh, you know, you both kind of mentioned it a bit, but for people who are just joining, maybe, I mean, it could be worth saying again, like, why is it important for people who care about the environment, people who are already sort of tapped into the environmental movement to also pay attention to what's happening in Tibet and, and how it might also affect them, even if they don't live anywhere in Asia, if they don't live anywhere near Tibet, um, do you, could you guys have any thoughts about why, why there's so much importance about what, you know, why we stress that it is, it is important for everybody to pay attention? I mean, I let Lubsang answer it as a policy question because Tibet is at the front line of the climate crisis, because Tibet is warming three times faster than the rest of the world. Because if you say that you want to take climate action, because if you say that you care about the environment, it cannot be independent of Tibet. It has to include Tibet. Um, like we talk about the, you know, the glacier meltdown in the Arctic region, Tibet is an issue. Tibet has been an issue for decades. Um, and the reason that it hasn't been mainstream is because because of China, because it has taken so long to get the information out, because it's taken so long to to you know 
any trickle of information that we get, it, ha- it takes forever to verify, uh, verify it. In terms of climate experts in the Tibetan, you know, who are Tibetan, um, Lupsang is there, right? So the reason to care is because it's at the front line and you cannot say that you care about the environment and you cannot say that you care about climate action without prioritizing Tibet because it is what it is. Um, it's heating three times faster than the rest of the world. And so I, I don't even know where to begin because to me, in my head, climate action is equal to Tibet climate crisis. They are not independent of each other. I don't see them as two separate issues. It's like, it's something like saying like, I care about the environment, but I don't care about the glacier meltdown because that is what we've, where we started or the ozone melt um you know the ozone holes because that's where the climate movement started um tibet climate crisis is the climate movement is the climate issue to talk about it is at the front line um but lopsan can be more you know uh, detailed about it because yeah it's as a campaigner it gets me really um anxious when people don't when people don't connect those two because for me they are one and the same. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, to add a little bit on that, um, so there is this saying that, uh, uh, I mean, injustice somewhere is injustice everywhere. Uh, so, and uh, I think uh, it's all inter- interconnected. And uh, suppose when we uh, talk about um, India, right, I mean, uh, India um, shares a border with the, with the Tibet. And uh, right now, because of the climate change and b- because of the global warming, uh, because of the glacier melting, um, the river sources uh, uh, of all the major rivers that flow in, in, in India, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it comes from, from Tibet. And so, uh, so, the Indians also have a huge responsibility to to raise voice on that. Uh, with, the, with the case of uh, Brahmaputra, it flows from Tibet. And when it flows from Tibet, it is called Yalung Tsangbo. And then when it flows in Assam and Arunachal, it's called Sian River. And then, you know, it's uh, the international name is Brahmaputra. And Chinese, uh, go- uh, Chinese government uh, is uh, building dams on that. But, uh, you know, the kind of responses that we uh, see from the Indian officials, Indian government uh, is very different from uh, the grassroots, uh, you know, environment uh, defenders uh, from like Assam or or, or Arunachal. And I think that uh, when we have a climate crisis uh, in Tibet, this will definitely have an impact on the uh, um, in, in, in India the people in Assam, the people in Arunachal, and also in Bangladesh, right? So you can't say that this is not my issue or that this is uh, their issue. I mean, it's all interconnected. And so I think uh, I think uh, the downstream nations uh, like Mekong, you know, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, they also have an impact. And uh, uh, they are also facing a critical situation because of the, uh, the water that flows from Tibet, the Mekong, Mekong River. So I th- I feel that in this you know the, the there should be alliance of the downstream nation and uh, have a you know uh, you know honest conversation with the with the Chinese government and then make China you know accountable for what they are doing and make China you know have uh, sign a water treaty or water agreement uh, with the downstream nations right so I think uh, that is still lacking. And so there is a, there is a lots of scope or lots of spaces where you know the whole people and the the governments uh, should should come together and then um, I mean protect uh, uh, and save save you save your 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 people. It's not only about Tibet. I mean Tibet's uh, environment crisis is also about Asia's uh, food and water security challenge. So that's that's the reason why you know they I mean everyone should work together and they 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 should be a solidarity and they why um, they uh, I mean that's that's why why we need uh, you know collaboration and uh, you know 
I mean, solidarity with the, all the downstream nations and then understand the whole issue. And then uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, so. So it's it's not only about Tibet, as I said earlier. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I also had another question sort of building off of that is um, in terms of Chinese policy and infrastructure and, and changes that are being made economically, which are actually impacting Tibet's environment. Um, like for example, the road building or infrastructure uh, around sacred sites or sacred Buddhist sites, like for example, Abhimachan. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that, about how that how it kind of has impacted over the years? Uh, so, so in 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 two thousands, uh, you know, the the early two thousands, the Chinese uh, government has uh, introduced a policy called Western Development Campaign. So this campaign uh, uh, was introduced because in before two thousand, the much of the economic development has been emphasized on the coastal area of uh, uh, the Chinese region. And then they realized that we have uh, uh, kind of ignored the Western region. And then they introduced a so-called uh, Western development campaign. And in this Western development campaign, so they, one of the major uh, uh, policy is infrastructure development and urbanization. And so now, because of these policies uh, in, in Tibet, uh, that is, uh, uh, we see lots of environment destruction and the kind of road constructions, uh, which are unnecessary, you know, is, which are unnecessary. As I said earlier, the Tibet land is very fragile. And uh, in fact, I mean, the, the number of population that we have in, in Tibet, the Tibetan population is very small, but we have a huge landscape, right? We huge landmass. And so for them, it's a mentality of a uh, you know, uh, colonizer way saying that, uh, you know, we have to uh, uh, beautify the whole, whole Tibetan land. And so that beautification has to be consumed by the 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 Chinese uh, 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 nationals or the, or the 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 outside tourists. So without uh, you know uh, really recognizing or appreciating or understanding the sacred land and the sacred uh, you know sites like Amemache, so they create uh, these kind of uh, you know infrastructures and then destroying the whole uh, you know the the nature. Uh, I mean, hold the the sacred uh, land. Over there, and what happens is that when the large number of tourists come over there, then uh, you know they they create pollution and they they throw the garbage everywhere, right? But sometimes there is also a way that you know the sometimes we also feel that maybe you know if there is a little bit of a uh, you know I mean tourism, so that might also generate uh, 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 employment uh, for the local Tibetan people, right? But I think uh, that has to understand and that has to really study and uh, really you know, allow the, uh, the local Tibetans, uh, they, their voice in that uh, decision making. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so th that's, that's one, uh, one, one part. And uh, so, and the creating unnecessary you know, roads uh, is uh, very problematic. And sometimes, you know, what happens when it comes to mining, so they would just come and they would do a mining on a sacred mountain or, or a land. And so when that happens, the local Tibetans are not allowed to see what's happening there. They were not provided any information whatsoever that they are doing in that place. And then once uh, the mining uh, uh, completes, then they build a dam on a huge tunnel uh, or they, they, they build, sorry, they build a road on that and then saying that we are bringing economic development, infrastructure development, urbanization on, on the land. So, but then sometimes, you know, I mean, they do mining over there. And then sometimes, uh, I mean, it's it's all about once they do the mining, then they would just uh, 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 keep, leave the, you know, the whole site there and not really working out and, uh, you know, protecting uh, the, the, the land. So these are the, we, so many uh, problems that that we we see in 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 Tibet, 
And then one also the road construction, uh, sometimes I uh, know for, for the Chinese uh, political, uh, you know, the, the thinking and the protecting the whole border is very important for, for the Chinese mainland um, country to save their own land, save their own country because of their sharing, having a, a border with, the, uh, you know, India or, or border with other neighboring countries. So for them, the road uh, construction on the Tibetan border area or the inland uh, allows them to you know, easily control or whenever some uprising or a protest happen, so they could easily you know, the send the whole uh, you know, the uh, armies over there to, 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 to control. So I think uh, it's, it's very important to understand the whole situation. And then every case is different in every every village. And thus, I, I feel that we need more uh, transparency and we need more open access to the whole whole region and then allow the, uh, the, uh, the scientific uh, research or allow the researchers to come and then, uh, you know, understand and then allow them to do a research. So that is uh, uh, also lacking right now in Interbet. Great. Um, and also today, uh, or the, the past uh, few days in Darmstadt, I know that you've been a part of this uh, dialogue for the future or dialogue for future. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? And then also, I know that earlier this morning, you, you, um, the, some of the delegates from the conference had an audience with His Holiness on Earth Day. And I was just wondering if, um, if His Holiness had anything in particular to say that was more hopeful and <laughs> about talking, mentioning any kind of uh, ideas about solutions or something along those lines that you want to share? Uh, yeah, so the conference, uh, the dialogue for our future is happening right now uh, in, in Dharamsala. And uh, so where, uh, uh, you know, many scholars have come here in Dharamsala and then discussing about the whole global climate crisis. And then also we have a special panel on, on uh, Third Pole uh, or, or uh, Tibet. And so this, this conference uh, is organized by the uh, International Campaign for Tibet, uh, TPI, Tibet Policy Institute, uh, uh, the Czech Tibet Support, and then URAC uh, Research uh, from Italy. And uh, so this morning, uh, we were very fortunate to have an audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And I feel so blessed. And so one thing that His Holiness kept uh, uh, saying was that uh, it's very important to uh, 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 preserve or protect uh, our uh, environment in, in Tibet, especially the water. So he kept uh, and, uh, emphasizing on the uh, uh, protecting the nature and specifically on a, on a water, saying that uh, you know it's not only about the Tibet uh, Tibetan people, but also the uh, billions of people you know living down down downstream. And then he the second thing he emphasized. Uh, uh, emphasis uh, uh, on in, in terms of education and how important it is to educate ourselves in terms of the environment uh, challenges that they we have and then he also emphasized uh, on compassion how compassion uh, uh, and love is uh, related when it comes to uh, uh, protecting our uh, uh, environment and how we are interdependent uh, with with each other, with the nature, and so thus it's the responsibility of whole global community to protect our planet. And uh, so, so it was a wonder, wonderful. And uh, so, His Holiness has been the like he has been uh, the uh, always you know the the uh, uh, main motivator and uh, the the role model. And he has really really. For a long time, uh, emphasized and uh, discussed about uh, you know protecting the environment and how important important the environment is uh, for for everyone. And so his message has also touched uh, many of the non tibetans who have come here. And so I think um, I think uh, uh, I think uh, we should we should uh, really follow what what his holiness. Uh, you know, set and uh, yeah. So I think uh, that today's uh, this morning's uh, you know audience with His Holiness uh, went really uh, well, and that uh, really personally for me inspired me a lot. 
Great. That's so wonderful. Um, just as we're starting to wrap up a little bit, um, I just wanted to ask Rashi if you could share some resources uh, that with, with everyone of where we can uh, tap in in different ways to uh, get involved with the movement or get involved with uh, to that climate crisis. So if you could just share a couple of things, how people can get, get involved today. Um, yeah, thanks. So we'll pop the website on the screen right now, but uh, you can head on to the Bed Climate Crisis. And on that, we have infographics, we have placards, we have petitions, we have, um, you know, sample letters that you can write to your representatives. Basically, we have an entire Google Drive filled with resources. We have videos, we have images that you can share. Um, but if you were to take five actions just today, I would suggest join a Tibet group. Um, and talk about the climate crisis. If it's not a priority campaign, please let us know and we will help you set it up. The second thing would be, like Lipsang said, spread the word. Social media is the place to go right now. So uh, use the resources, use the images. There are talking points there. Um, create tweets. Use the hashtag to climate crisis um, and really plug it in. Uh, today, today we're talking about um, on hashtag Earth Day 22, uh, climate crisis, climate action, climate strike now, all of these are like hashtags that people use to plug into them, listen to them and see what people are talking about and see where Tibet applies. The third thing you can do is go on strike for Tibet climate crisis. So take one of the placards. Uh, Fridays for Future has strikes every Friday in, in different cities of the, on the world and they have an interactive map on their website. Uh, you can go see where the protest is happening and go talk to other climate activists about Tibet climate crisis. Uh, the, the fourth thing that you can do is um, write a letter to your representative to tell them about Tibet, tell them what's happening. Um, and we have all the, you know, we have a list of, um, we have like sample letters that you can use as well as, you know, jumping off points. And the fifth and I think, uh, depending upon your capacity, if these are actions that you can take, I would also suggest maybe if if you want to support um, activists and climate experts like Lopsang, you can go and donate, set up a monthly donation with uh, Tibet Climate Crisis just so that like, you know, Lopsang can go on and research and keep doing the work that she's doing because honestly, we don't have uh, we don't have enough climate experts in exile who, who are talking about Tibet as a frontline issue. Um, and Lupsang is doing that and she is absolutely brilliant. And we kind of need to amplify these voices and we need to amplify the voices of Anya Sendra and Karma Samrut. So go sign the petitions, share that on social media and tell other people what's happening in Tibet because uh, we really, really need to do that. Great, thank you. Um, so, that's pretty much our time. So thank you so much to Lops and Young. So Rashi, thank you to everyone who uh, have joined us for this past hour. Um, I think it's, it's sort of goes without saying that this is a, I mean, it's a, a nice moment in the day as we all think about Earth Day, as we think about what we can do for the planet in our own way, how we can educate ourselves more, what kind of resources are available. Um, and how you know we have we have like a handful of sort of Tibet climate crisis experts, but we need like a dozen or two dozen Lopsa Yangsos. You know, we need we need lots of people who have expertise on the topic and and uh, you know find figure out ways that we can support them or support campaigns um, in any capacity uh, is great. And and these are all very. Uh, feasible actions and well within our reach. And uh, again, like, I hope that we can do more of these conversations uh, moving forward. And uh, I just want to say thank you again, like on behalf of the uh, Jamyang Buddha Center, and thank you to ITN uh, for doing this. And I think we're going to actually close with um, a very wonderful message from His Holiness the Dalai Lama um, that he recorded. A, a, there's a video of His Holiness from uh, last year's uh, Earth Day, uh, which is about why it's important to 
uh, save the planet and to think about this earth that we live on. So thank you again for joining us and uh, we will close with that video. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This blue planet is only our home. Next one decade or two decades, I will go. On moon, also some uh, water, but uh, you see, uh, we try to settle there, impossible. <laughs> Mars, these stars uh, remain in the sky, in blue sky. It's nice. If we go there, impossible. In India, vegetarianism, in thousand years, uh, in the West, you see, too much eat meat, uh, not only is a question of a sense of sort of love, these animals, but itself, you see, very bad for uh, ecology. Of course, we eat better, also a non-vegetarian, uh, but we decided most of our monastic institution to uh, now stop serving meat. For health viewpoint also, vegetarian is very, very uh, suitable, very good. Coming generation, they should think the pleasant planet, blue planet, is only our home.